Hello, everybody. Welcome to Chuck Free Uncorked. Joining us this week is the Gram Sam Ariana Suchia. Hey to there. the far left, in the center is our special guest of the week, Mr. Richard Field. My father-in-law. <laughs> yeah, founder of Our Field Wine Company, one of the iconic, game-changing wine minds of all time here in Hawaii. We're very honored that he's here. I think it's a very important time to hear his stories, his insights, his wisdoms, and his experiences, because I think there's an opportunity for all of us to keep learning and moving forward. And I want him to share with us how he changed the game in Hawaii. Absolutely. I would say a lot of our guests that actually came on to Chuck Furrier Uncorked in one way or another were influenced from the R Field wine movement. I would Absolutely. also say that, you know, you created a, lo- a lot of people interested in wine, not just sommeliers, but the general public. Why should we be purchasing these things? So I would say thank you. Thank you, first of all. So, Richard, um, welcome to the show. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to be like that. <laughs> so, um, just to give you viewers some history, he started actually the still in Kaimaki first. And although he had some wine, it was more beer and snacks and soda pop uh, drinks driven. And, and then he opened. That was right on Kapahulu, or is that different? No, that was, it was Kaimuki. On, yeah, it was on Wailai. Wailai. Oh, okay. And then the second store he opened was called the Still. That's the one that was oh, in okay. Kapahulu, which I showed you, then became Tokurite, and now it's something else. Got it. So that was actually the Still, and that one was very wine. Oh, I he see. He had wines like crazy over there. And then from there, he then uh, launched and, and created uh, our field wine company. And the first one, I believe, was uh, Ward, Ward Center. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So when you, what year was that that you opened uh, our field? Uh, let's see. We opened still in 1977, then 79, and then 82, and then 84. Oh, and... busy guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it was really interesting because it went from, it, it progressed from beer mm-hmm. to wine, and then the move to, towards, uh, to Ward Center. Mm-hmm. Of course, the rent's going to be astronomical, the common area maintenance, everything. But it was a move um, to to attract a different demographic, mm-hmm. you know, because that whole area was kind of like, uh, you know, was Ward. Yeah. And so you had a very different clientele. And with that, you saw the progression mm-hmm. of selections of food and wine. Is that safe to say? Yes. Uh, first, I got to tell you that the uh, Hughes family owned that shopping right. center at the time, and it was uh, n- not a major uh, shopping conglomerate right. con- conglomeration as it is now. <coughs> they actually came to me and oh. said, uh, we'd like you to create a concept and bring it to Ward Center. And they took care of us. So uh, we didn't start with uh, huge overhead. So, uh, and they even built out my store for me. That was that's awesome. They were they were fantastic. They were concerned because Napa Valley Grocery Company had been there before, yes. and they had done a terrific job. And they had <laughs> opened a beautiful restaurant next to El Fresco. El Fresco, yeah. Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason, that didn't work out. And the Hughes family wanted to still have uh, upscale presence, and so they had asked for this concept to be produced. So. Uh, we did some homework. It took a uh, better part of a year to come up with the concept and then finally made this uh, move. So in, in what was your vision? Um, well, there's a whole bunch of uh, things I wanted to accomplish, and we started off tripping over our feet immediately. One, uh, a shopping center is not the place to put a wine store. Uh, nobody wants to walk from the parking lot carrying oh, cases of wine I and see. beer and and, you know, uh, so, uh, Ward worked with us on that. So we had some dedicated sp- spaces in the front, but still it was not the ideal place to put a store like this. Number two was that they wanted us to be a destination store and this was a shopping center. We had Mary <laughs> Catherine's bakery on the other end, which was a destination. You had Compadre's restaurant upstairs. You had all the restaurants Andrews, upstairs. Yeah. Andrews. They were the destination. Monterey Canners, yeah. And there used to be a Ralph Lauren Polo store at the bottom. Right. That's really, those were the destination stores. Was it local clientele, a mix of tourists? Uh, or? Well, Ralph Lauren was Tourist. Japanese, mm-hmm. and uh, the, all the restaurants were tourists and locals. But this was an unusual shopping center because usually businesses die on the second floor. Oh. Right. Then. Not 
Ward Center. Ward right. Center was all about the second floor. Yeah. Right. The first floor was difficult. So we really had to work hard to uh, make this store a destination store. And we didn't treat our marketing uh, like uh, a shopping center. Mm-hmm. We, we, uh, we didn't behave like a shopping center store. We behaved like a freestanding independent store. Mm-hmm. And so we had to create uh, uh, activities. We had to create events. We had to do things to get attention all the time. Um, uh, the two newspapers, the columnists, were became good friends of mine because I was feeding them so many. I was coming up with all kinds of ideas <laughs> all the time about what's happening, what uh, celebrity came in, you oh, know, wow. anything and everything to get in the paper. Would you have like little events or tastings oh, at the store? We had. We created things that were not wine related, oh. but make you. I mean, I had Sammy Hagar yeah. do a tasting. Oh wow, <laughs> I rock had, star! <laughs> uh, uh, oh, Bill Cosby. Well, that was the wine festival, but uh, uh, Hamilton. What's his first name? Uh, George Hamilton. George Hamilton did a cigar, cigar. tasting yeah. in front of our store. Wow. We had. Uh, I mean, we, we had all kind of people. And, of course, we had Chuck Furuya. <laughs> the one and no, only. No, but, you know, here's the thing, Ariana, just to, so you understand. Mm-hmm. Our field transitioned from the still, and it became the finest of the finest. Mm-hmm. The finest Scottish smoked salmon. Mm-hmm. The finest caviar. The finest cigars. He had foie gras. Was, he was the first guy to really retail foie gras. He, uh, you know, he had all kinds of specialty foods that were, you know, I mean, whether it's marinara or... You know, just everything was the best, including wines. Mm-hmm. And so if you wanted the best, whether it was Krug Champagne or Salon Champagne, he pioneered, you know, Kermit Lynch wine merchants really here in Hawaii, mm-hmm. Santa Barbara, Germany with the Fritz Hog and all these things. So he created this whole uh, dream yeah. that other people would chase. You know, he, he created a market that was not available mm-hmm. in in the big box stores. Yeah. You know, so if you wanted good Fagua, if you wanted good anything, you went to our field wine company. So for you, how did you find these items? Because obviously you're passionate about wine, but how do you find these cigars? How do you find quality smoked salmon and things like that? I'm going to back up and not answer that question directly because first I have to explain the challenges uh, Mm. that the retail market had back then. And that was that it was a, uh, and I'll argue it is again, a distributor-driven market. In other words, what was in the restaurants, what was in the retail stores was there because the distributors said, this is, this is what is. I have to sell you and here's your choices. Pick, take your pick. And we refused. We absolutely said, some of these things are acceptable to us, but many of these are not. If I can share a quick story. Um, absolutely. When I started uh, the second store, uh, the still, uh, by then, I had already been trying to study. I'd been trying to teach myself about wine. Um, I didn't know anybody who knew about wine. Um, I knew that there was Brian Geyser. I knew that Chuck Fruia was there. I, you know, I, I knew of the, those icons in, the, in town, but I didn't have interaction with people because I wasn't selling fine wine yet. And um, uh, so I would study books like Hugh Johnson's World Atlas oh, of Wine. Nice. Yeah. I would study Jancis Robinson's books. And mm-hmm. after a while, I'd be flipping pages and I'd be reading the description of Cabernet from California, which is two pages, versus Bordeaux, which is nine pages. And the descriptions were so similar. Or Chardonnay and uh, Sauvignon Blanc from Loire, when I read the descriptions, they almost sound like the same wine. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, you're, you're doing a great job telling me, describing the uh, regions, mm-hmm. but you're doing a horrible job explaining to me how I know the difference between these <laughs> wines. I don't get it. The other thing that these books were good at was uh, conveying the regional cuisine with the regional wines and what the magic was supposed to be and that these uh, marriages had occurred well before, you know, we... Mm-hmm. we as uh, culinary uh, experts put these things together. So I said, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was almost broke. I jumped on a plane. 
I went to Florence, where Chianti is. I went to a, a little cafe, and uh-huh. just before getting on that plane, I drank <coughs> uh, Antonori Chianti. Mm-hmm. I also had it with a uh, plain plate plate of pasta with uh, tomato sauce and I said it doesn't taste that marriage doesn't taste anything like these books are telling me the wine started to become metallic in my mouth I didn't enjoy it at all mm-hmm. um, the, the fruit was all gone the the it, it was horrible so I said I'm gonna go find out so literally by myself I flew to Firenze and I went to uh, Tuscany found this small place and this is late at night, mm-hmm. asked for... Literally right off the plane, basically. Went right there. <laughs> wow. Saw a bottle of Antonori Chianti, and I said, perfect. I want that, and I wanted... Um, I forgot the name of it. <laughs> like a bolognese or bolognese, something. Bolognese, yeah. yeah. You know? And opened, uh, drank it, and I said, number one, this wine doesn't taste like the bottle I just had the other day. Mm-hmm. Number two... That pasta doesn't taste like the pasta I have at home. And number three, that pasta sauce tastes nothing like the pasta sauce that I have. Mm -hmm. So then breaking it down, I'm saying, okay, what's causing the wine to taste bad? Well, it turns out as much as or as little as I knew back then, Mm -hmm. I realized that these were ripe tomatoes and a variety of tomato that I was unfamiliar with. This was a type of pasta made from semolina that I had no idea at the time. Mm-hmm. And the next thing started me on my quest. When I got home, I wanted to know why that wine tasted so different. Mm-hmm. And then I started tasting more wines. And I would travel to California and I was forcing myself to learn. And, and I started to realize Just none of the wines. Yourself. The yeah. wines did not taste the same here in Honolulu. I said, something's wrong. So... I decided I'm going to go to those distributors' warehouses and see. And mm-hmm. back in those days, McKesson had a warehouse on Sand Island Road. Yep. And the wines were stacked, I don't know, 60, 70 feet high. Right. Uh, Robert Mondavi wines were their premium right. cabs. Cab. And, and it was way up there. And I and I was already sweating down <laughs> on, the, on the warehouse floor. And I said... I don't think that's good. You guys, I don't think you should be doing this. Hot air rises. Yeah. And, you know, everybody blew me off. So what did I do? I decided, well, this set the next thing in motion. I created a newsletter because we didn't have social media. Imagine. Yeah. (laughs) So we created a, a newsletter And I wrote this article about how the wines were being transported to Hawaii. I started to do some research, how it came across on the mats and containers, where the containers sat uh, on the barges, and were were they refrigerated? Of course not. And by the time they got to the warehouse, how they were... And I just documented the whole thing. The Star Bulletin, I think, or maybe it was the advertiser, picked up my article, gave me some credit for it, and did an article. And things apparently started to change because they were embarrassed. Wow. So, okay, so that started me going. I thought, wow, we got a little little, little uh, clout here. Yeah. And so that's really the three things that happened in a short period of time that um, all kind of got me immersed and said, okay, yeah. I'm, I'm doing this. Mm-hmm. It's about thinking about not just the wine in the glass, but how did it get to come in your glass, correct? Mm-hmm. No, just everything. How can I improve the pasta? How can I Mm -hmm. improve the sauce by carrying the ingredients? How can I Mm -hmm. improve the quality of the wine? Because I had it in Italy. It tastes different here. So he took the concept of instead of settling for the norm, Mm -hmm. how can I do it better? And And how can I communicate (laughs) that? So that's why he pioneered all these different areas because he was he was so far ahead of his competition. Mm -hmm. You know because he. Broke it down, and he researched to, to do it better. And then the other thing I'd like to add on that note is he commented to me at your dinner the other night mm-hmm. at Zia's. He, he made a comment to me, there's an opportunity for that again now. Mm-hmm. You know, so that everybody, we've, we've gone into commodities again and whatnot is what he was alluding to. And so there's an opportunity for someone to say, okay, let's carry this wine from Corsica. 
that's brought all the way here in temperature control. It's indigenous, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and so I think he sees that again. Is that a true statement? That's true. So if you go back out to the retail stores, <clears throat> it, while it's uh, considerably <laughs> better than it used to be, you know, right. when they started, we we seem to be in a contraction mode again. We seem to be, uh, and, and this doesn't make sense because during the period of COVID, the restaurants can't buy all yeah. the good wines anymore. So, so in theory, sh- in yeah. theory, the <laughs> retailer should be picking this, picking some of this up. Um, and I don't understand. Maybe I'm not asking the right questions, but the wines aren't there. And number two, I would think that the retailers would have some clout to uh, go find the wines that they really want. And it seems to me, uh, I'm going to say it's laziness um, or or the passion is lacking um, because well, that's one of the other things that I was very fortunate about too because the people that came to work for me eventually became brainwashed and focused and <laughs> no, but Don't passionate. use the word brainwashed, <laughs> passionate. That's different, very, very different. And see how she cut you off? So anyway, <clears throat> so let me say this on that note because that's, that's the other part of the equation that needs to mm-hmm. be discussed. So if you look at what I call the mafia, if you look at the followers of our, the, the people that were in our field wine company, the, the group for so many years, look how many of them, mm-hmm. Kevin Toyama, Marvin Chang, Tim. Uh, Tim Learmont, all you know, all those three guys. Uh, two of them passed the advanced in 1991. Kevin passed in 93. Ka- Catherine Fallas, who's a master sommelier today, she passed the advanced in 93. She she worked at our field. Roberto Viernes um, worked at our field. Randy Caparoso, uh, didn't he? Yes, work? Yes, yeah. and David Gocross, who passed advanced in 91. All these people were our field wine company. You know, so Mike Horke was our field wine company. So you have this. People who understood what the wines were and could tell the story to the customers instead of just unpacking bottles and putting them on the shelves. Absolutely. So he had a sta- sales team that could help you understand what Obon Climat was or what uh, Silvaner was from Germany or why drink Krug over Dom Perignon or Cristal. He had the sales team to back up. And then from there, the final piece that I think is very, very important is that... Um, you know, what separates Richard from many, many different people, there's been a, f- a few other people like this, they champion the concept. Absolutely. So he didn't give all of, of his lieutenants um, the chance to, you know, he just said, I'm buying the wine, you learn to sell it. So that's why it was Kermit Lynch and, and sellers and that, things that were like totally out of the box, but totally moving in a finer, finer realm. Mm-hmm. And he just bought the wines and he said, you guys got to sell it. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to find out how to sell it, why to sell it and, all, and who to sell it to. But you got, so he championed those, those concepts because he understood that it made the, the retail better mm-hmm. as an industry. It, it separated him from everybody else. But it also the people that worked for him, he's giving them knowledge to upgrade themselves instead of just settling for the norm. It wasn't esoteric stuff. It was just better and better stuff, whether it was single barrel cognac or a Scottish smoked salmon, you know, the one he got, it was just mm-hmm. excellent. And he just found ways to source it. And so he was the first one to sell Nala Green's retail, just oh, to wow. give you an example. Haula Tomatoes, you know, so he pioneered many, many, Heron's Coffee, it was him. Oh, wow. You know, so I'm um, single estate coffee from Kona, you mm-hmm. know, so understand he created a, he created a new standard for us. A new tier of quality. Yeah, and so that that's what he stands for. And he made it happen because he championed it. He didn't, it wasn't convenient. It wasn't easy to do. He took a stance. And he also inspired the team to champion yes. it, correct? So yes. what I'm hearing is that, I know you said brainwash, but I would like to say zealous and passionate were the people that were working at our fields, like Randy, like, you know, Uncle Kevin and Tim and whatnot. What does fellowship mean to you? And what does mentorship mean? Yeah, uh, What's amazing, or maybe not so amazing, is that, you know, I would uh, uh, open bottles all the time, mm-hmm. uh, always. And it was always, uh, we're always tasting, always tasting. It didn't matter if it was beer, scotches, whatever it took. Uh, I remember a night that we went to a bar in uh, Waikiki, mm-hmm. and they had this fantastic selection of liqueurs, whiskeys, everything. And I ordered one of everything. Wow. And I said, we're going to taste 
all of these things. Oh, Christmas party or and what? We're going, to, <laughs> we're going to know what all these, what's That's the difference awesome. between all these things are. So they were just little things. And, you know, I guess when you're younger, this was inspirational and uh, it was setting themselves apart. I mean, mm-hmm. this is fantastic. I, you know, two of my stars were, you know, Farrington boys. They had no exposure to this kind of life. Um, is that not Uncle that, Kevin and Tim? And, and Tim, okay. yep. Uh, I, of course, my family didn't come from uh, money either, so uh, it was new to me as well. So I understood the excitement you could create, and they um, they grasped it with uh, all all they got, and they would start doing tastings on their own after work, wow. and uh, wake me up at two in the morning if because they had an argument about a wine they were tasting and. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was, it was fantastic. Just really wanted to champion it themselves and also mm-hmm. not just study it for the sake of studying it, but get it, mm-hmm. grasp it, understand it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for retail. I mean, I could say a lot about Lyle Fujioka too. He championed things in a different realm, a different niche. Mm-hmm. You know, I could say something about Glenn Tamorgas. He did champion things in his own way mm-hmm. and in a different niche. You know, they, they, they didn't overlap. There were different niches. I could say something about Alan Cam and Vintage Wine Cellar because mm-hmm. he championed a lot of things in, in very different niches. So they weren't really competitors. They just were people had their that own sections they had the their market. own clientele and whatnot. But all of these were game changers. But mm-hmm. Richard Field was the one really that brought, you know, these kind of wines to Hawaii. I mean, so let me say this. You know, Richard, as I mentioned to you, we uh, we always, uh, with our interviews, just to make things more interesting, uh, you know, I, I, I we try to open up the show with something, et cetera, et cetera. And then after a while, we're going to take a break. And then I'd like to bring your son, Michael Field, on. And uh, my son, Kali uh, Furuya, on. And we have a more of a father-son talk story session because I don't know if our two kids really know us as well as we hope so, or think. So you don't like the, the father-daughter-in-law <laughs> session here? Well, He's editing right now. No, so let me just say this. Okay, let me say it in a nice way. Uh, I would like to be equal with everybody inst- instead of being told what to do. Okay, let me just say that nicely. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. So to all of you, stay tuned. We'll be right back with uh, two other uh, guests. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Chuck Free Uncorked. No push, bro. No, whatever. So, <laughs> and joining us in this segment is Cully, my son. Over there is uh, Michael Field, uh, Ariana's husband and son of the legendary Richard Field, founder of Our Field Wine Company. And I just want to be clear that mm-hmm. he sold it some years uh, back, so he's not really uh, involved with that company anymore, but he was the founder. Mm-hmm. So I thought this segment would be more about father sons talking story, you know, maybe Richard and I give a little insight into us to our our children, and at the same time you kind of sneak in and get a insider's view of all that <clears throat> and the discussions. So hopefully it can make you think differently moving forward. That's the whole point. Whether it's mm. our sons or it's the viewers, that's the intent of this segment. So just to kind of like loosen up the tension. You know, Michael Field has a lot of tension over there on my <laughs> left. I can feel it all the way here. You can cut it with a butter knife. I know. I think you need a steak knife. It's so tense. That's intense. Okay. So we're starting off with a uh, wine that the grape variety is called Müller Turgau. It comes from Franconia, Germany. And this is the great Rudolf First, 2003 Gomio Winemaker of the Year. So Richard was one of the first to bring this to Hawaii both the Pinot Noir and the Mueller Turgau. So I thought we'd, uh, we'd start off just talking about a game-changing wine. That he's familiar with as that well. That he's familiar with and he helped to pioneer <coughs> here in Hawaii. Okay. So, uh, Richard, what are, you, what are your thoughts about this wine? So, again, we don't need to break it down like Massa Sommelier kind of thing, but what, maybe you can get some insight into how you taste the wine, what you look for, and then maybe the opportunities that you would consider drinking this and perhaps some foods hmm. that you might think about. And Michael, I'm going to ask you next. So start thinking about this. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what's interesting is, you know, how, how I look at a wine, uh, I try to look at a wine from a more holistic view. Um, and when I look at food, I tend to not be so holistic. I tend to look specifically at herbs, 
sauces, uh, and then uh, what the protein is or, or what, what uh, the, the main part of the uh, dish is. Mm. So then I start looking at, at wine, at the wine and at its selections. And for me, um, you know, people talk about uh, the somewhereness in wine, and that's always been important. But I also uh, think that, you know, the people talk about terroir and the mm-hmm. soil. Um, and I think most people, when they talk about that, they're not uh, clear on what that actually means and how that applies to the food. And so I thought maybe I'll, I'll clarify because uh, when we talk about terroir or soil, we're, we're not talking about only the dirt and the rocks. We're talking about the depth. We're talking about water tables. We're talking about uh, fog line. We're talking about uh, aspect. We're talking about wind. Wind. Um, surrounding countryside. Wind, surrounding countryside, flora and fauna, uh, organisms, um, <coughs> obviously grape types. And, and so, um, and, and that's why I think uh, traveling and going to these wineries or talking to people who have uh, really, this, this uh, helps you have a, a form of somewhereness in your mind. So even if you've never been to Franconia and Chuck tells you about it, it starts to form uh, a somewhereness for mm-hmm. you. And understanding. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, so let me comment on that too because I'm kind of going through that with, stu- like <laughs> I was just talking to my dad about this today. I'm, I'm kind of studying for my, for a psalm, uh, intro psalm test. And he was commenting that it's like now I'm not just it's not about just tasting the wine. You have some idea that you're forming of what these wines or these grapes are supposed to taste like. And you're adding that into enjoying a wine or tasting wine. Gives you a core to work from. Mm -hmm. Michael, so what are your thoughts on this wine? It's one of those wines I really find. just. You see how your dad dodged the question, by the way. But (laughs) but your turn. You can carry the torch for the family. (laughs) It's a wine that I find really, really crisp, refreshing, Mm -hmm. and it's just. Honestly, I just want to drink it on a hot day because it's so crisp and refreshing. It helps to like lighten things up, which is nice. Yeah, but it's not shrill acid like Mosul. Right. It's got spritziness to it too. It's got a slight effervescence. So to me, this is a perfect segue away from Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay. For those people that enjoy Chardonnay or Sauvignon Blanc, this has some richness to it <coughs> in comparison to other grapes. Mm-hmm. But the acid is not as sharp as you get from Sauvignon Blanc, especially from New Zealand. This wine has a strong minerality, which makes it very interesting. So, you know, Richard pioneered the Santa Barbara Chardonnays, uh, many of them to Hawaii. And, and, you know, minerality was introduced through those wines as being more and more important in California. So this wine also has minerality. So I think it's a really good segue from those kind of wines. Um... I think the winemaking is very sophisticated. I think this wine is very transparent. It's very pure. You know, I I just think the wine is really good. What kind of foods would you have it with? We'll start with Cully. We'll start with you. <laughs> Come on. <clears throat> um, we'll start with you. You see how sassy he is? I, I, I'm just beginning my phase, so I, I, I want to hear what you and, and Uncle Richard have to say. Or well, even Michael, Michael. Michael used to work at Alan Wong's, right? Yeah. For quite a quite a long time, and he's familiar with this wine as well. Okay, so Michael, what would you think about pairing <coughs> uh, with this wine? I guess first I have to apologize to Mark if he's watching. <laughs> if I answer this wrong, that's Mark Shishido, uh, the cellar master. Yeah, if you watch previous <coughs> episodes, you might recognize him. Uh, we did do a Paul Ferris Mueller Turgau, and it was one of my favorite wines by the glass, just because it tastes so crisp and refreshing, and I'm really I love mineral wines like this. I think the things that I liked this most with were those kind of lighter fish dishes because it it kind of had this crispness to kind of cut through it. Like a lemon would. Like a lemon, exactly. Mm. Kinda, kinda like like a squeeze of lemon would yeah. over a fish. Richard, what kind of foods would you imagine this wine with? l l chicken curry plate. Oh. Oh, now we're getting specific. Mm-hmm. Why? try that now me too i definitely <laughs> want to try that now what the hell are you talking about l and l what the l and l maybe this is about? a segue into micah suderman's fine wines and local grounds <laughs> yeah. introducing I mean, that because you know the the curry is not uh over the top spicy right so um and then chicken or fish this wine will 
give a refreshing uh, refresher palate for the next mm. bite, and uh, uh, that curry dish isn't you know very uh, uh, full or powerful. So this this goes with nice balance. Okay, Richard. So um, <clears throat> on the previous episode with Ariana that we just shot. You know, you mentioned about how um, to start off your whole concept of what you want to do for Artfield Wine Company and the transition <clears throat> from the still to Artfield Wine Company. You talked about taking a trip to specifically uh, Florence um, and Chianti. Uh, yeah, Chianti, and yeah. specifically trying the wine there, trying the food, trying the tomato sauce, marinara or there, et cetera. You know, so what were some of the other aha moment trips that you had that you could share with your son Michael? Uh, there have been so many, but, uh, go ahead, brag me. <laughs> me I went to Kalihi yesterday. <laughs> One of the trips that was uh, monumental was, uh, uh, I got to experience, uh, two and three star restaurants in, in Paris and other cities in, in France. Um, not drive-ins, but bro. guess what? We had in tow a three-year-old in diapers. And he drank wine and the finest foods that the French could produce. <laughs> and so he was exposed to uh, incredible foods <coughs> and, and fine wine at an early age. That's and, why he's uh, like that. And maybe, <laughs> Michael said the first know. wine he ever knew the name of was Krug. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to ask a question. Um, what? How did you guys, you two, meet each other? And what was that? What was? What were your first impressions of him? And what were your first impressions of Richard, Uncle Richard? I thought Richard dre- dressed really nice. He always had style. He always <laughs> had nice collars. You see me. Everybody has to fix my collars. Not with Richard Field. They were perfectly starched. They had perfect form. You know, he always was so stylish, and whatnot. And he did things with style. If you look at what he did at the stores. He did it in a style that nobody else in Hawaii was doing. You know, it's kind of like pre Neiman Marcus, but not so expensive. You know, mm-hmm. but it was that kind of, that kind of look, that kind of uh, lifestyle thing. You know, he was really on it. And Uncle Richard, what were your first impressions of meeting my dad? He used to dress really nice too. <laughs> he didn't wear Aloha shirts every day. That's true. I wore a tuxedo for six yeah, and a half years of right. my life. Six and a half? Uh-huh. Sixteen and a half years. I wore a tuxedo. Yeah. I would go to uh, tastings at night up at Bagwell's when uh, Chuck was there. So after after he closes down, we would sit at the bar and taste wines. Um, uh, I knew of Chuck, of course. Everybody who was in wine knew of Chuck, uh, but to meet and uh, you know get to interact with somebody who was one of the pioneering uh, master sommeliers. Um, I, I had known Richard Dean, who was, I don't know, one of the very first. Second in America. Second in America. And, um, you know, and then to have, and, you know, 2020 is probably a good good time to point this out, that we have an Asian American who was a master sommelier way back then, and this was a court of master sommeliers from England. And um, you had to really break <laughs> ground to do what he did uh, and be respected and earn the respect of all of these people all around the world. Mm. Mm. Uh, so what, what about a wine moment that you'd like to share with your son? Uh, you know, I, I know he was tagging along when he was three years old. Some of us uh, are not that fortunate. I'm lucky <laughs> to go to... Zippies once a week, you know, <laughs> once every other week, but never Michelin. That's not Michelin two or three. So something you'd like to share with uh, Michael that was really a, a profound moment for you. Huh, profound. That's difficult um, because there have been uh, profound moments where <laughs> illegally at the Prince Hotel when Mark Shishida was the F&B over there, uh, they used <laughs> to have a, a brunch. And they had these flights of uh, scotch and, and cognac. And so I ordered a flight of uh, each, <coughs> and they would be at varying ages. And uh, I put them in front of my, uh, I guess, 13-year-old son, which was Mike, Michael's oldest brother. And I said, I'm going to describe them to you, and you tell me, you put these in order. And he 
had never had spirits before. <laughs> he put it to his nose, almost fell off the chair. He put them in order, all six glasses. So for me, that was like, okay, if I, if I can communicate effectively, I can talk to my staff and I can talk to my customers. If my <clears throat> 12 or 13 year old son can do this. Wow, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, what happened to Michael, man? You dropped the ball somewhere <laughs> along the line, bro. That's all I want to say. But, uh, okay, so let me well, share Mike, you. Michael was uh, much more ingrained from the very beginning because the other two were already considerably older by the time I, st I was in the business. He, yeah. Michael grew up with all of this all around him. I mean, he just said that he would take him in diapers as a three-year-old baby to two or three-star Michelin restaurants in Paris. So that's pretty entrenched in... Food and I, I used to see those Michelin three stars, from, but from a distance. <laughs> so anyway, uh, let me just say uh, one of the aha moments that I had with Richard, just to share with you, I never shared this part with you, but when we were talking outside before we came in here, you know, we went to France together one year. I, I don't know if it was 89 or 90 or perhaps 91. I think it was 90 around there, maybe 91. And uh, although we left around the same time. Left Hawaii. Yeah, left, left Hawaii time. around the same time. He ended up at the Marseille airport. I ended up at the Avion airport further north in the Chateauneuf-du-Pape Appalachian. You know, small airport, small. I mean, smaller than the old Lanai airport. And I ended up getting stuck there in the winter with no food, no, <laughs> I had no money. I had no phone. I, I, I stuck for three days in there. And Richard, had, in, in the meantime, was down there in Marseille and caught a tax, taxi cab all the way to Tampier across Provence at night, you know, and he got to stay with Lulu Perrault and, and the, Tom, uh, the parent, uh, Perrault family. We had two different experiences. But the thing I want to share with you. I thought you guys you, went on that trip together. I you know, but <laughs> eventually we got together. But I, the thing I wanted to share with you was that I'll never forget is we visited some of the most iconic producers of all time. Yep. We were at Shav in Hermitage. We were at... Which is in the Rhone Valley. Yeah, we yeah. were at uh, uh, Klapp and Versailles and Cornas in the Rhone Valley. But the, one of the moments was most memorable. We had an audience with Marius Gentes at Gentes de Vue, which I believe his last vintage was 92. So he was, the, he was the Syrah maker in the world, right? So we had this unreal visit with him and understand it was like a converted garage and it was you know it was with the man himself and he was drawing pictures on his wall of that coat roti was actually seven hillsides and he was trying to explain to us in his french and um you know it was just quite a memorable experience but the thing i want to share with you after two and a half weeks or so in in france and we went all over the place to all these different wineries and whatnot we ended up uh, driving up to Paris, and we we're going to fly out of Paris. Wait, wait, wait. Before we go there, i got to finish the story from Gentez to review. No, I want to finish the story first. <laughs> you tell the story later. <laughs> Whose show is this? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's your name anyway? <laughs> so uh, I wanted to share this with you. On the way out in Paris, I had a hankering for Oriental food because all this French food only goes so far. It's Asian. Asian food, <laughs> okay. So anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> We, we, we were, so we stopped at this Chinese restaurant in Paris and it was three levels and outside was parked all these Mercedes Benz and all these Rolls Royces. It was bling, 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 bling. And we had to walk up the stairs and we were watching everybody eat. It was all bling. They had fur coats. It, it was bling, 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 bling. So when we're sitting up on the third floor in the Garut section, right? And I'm looking at the menu and everything like that. And don't look like Chinese food, not like your grandparents' <laughs> food. You know, let me just say that. But they had Gentas de Review Cote Roti on the wine list. 89. So your dad and I bought the stash. We're in a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> they had the greatest Syrah ever made. The 89 Gentas on their wine list. And would that go with Chinese food? No, forget it. But, <laughs> but the very fact that we could get Gentas de Review Cote So we split. He took some. I took some. And, and we brought it back home. That was memorable. Gonna put a plug in that that's my birth year. Hint, hint. <laughs> nudge, nudge, wink. In oh. case you guys have any secret stash that you want to open up <laughs> on Michael's birthday that's coming up. Well, as that, well, you know, I remember your dad was stashing plenty for you <clears throat> of all from all different wines of the world. So don't worry, he's got you covered. <laughs>
Okay, anyway, <laughs> so go back to the Genta story. <clears throat> so the Genta story, we, uh, <coughs> there were several of us, including a French-Canadian who could speak French, obviously. Um, and as we did the tour, uh, they only spoke uh, French, so uh, everything <coughs> we said and everything he said had to go through that interpreter. Uh, that guy, by the way, owned a chain of very uh, successful, huge volume stores in Canada. Wine stores. Wine stores. And um, uh, I think that was his first trip to places like this, and he was uh, awestruck as well. So uh, Chuck was asking questions because we were tasting barrel samples, and the barrel samples were... Uh, it, what it is is Gentest Review doesn't make any specific bottlings or single vineyard or... Uh, other designations. It's one wine, and it's a uh, combination of the seven uh, vineyards. And as he was letting us taste the wines, Chuck would say, is this such and such vineyard? And the interpreter would tell him, and he would say, we, and continue talking, and then give us another barrel. I think when he got to the third one, and Chuck nailed it again, that's when uh, he decided something's wrong because <laughs> nobody could possibly know what those individual vineyards taste like because he doesn't sell them as individuals. So he was awestruck at what Chuck was doing at that moment. That was shop though, huh? Oh, you're right. Sorry. It, it was, <clears throat> but at was, least I got to tell the story. Wait, so how do you know what, <laughs> what vineyard is coming from if you've shop. never tasted it individually? Well, I didn't know for sure, but it's soil-driven. Each of the parcels had different soils. And I could smell it and feel it from, from the parcel. Yeah, so. that's how. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a 101. That, it was Shav, by the way. Shav and Eritas. Are we going to make a how-to video on that? No. <laughs> so, Michael, it's your turn to ask some questions. You're sitting over there. We don't need spectators right now. We need participants. I think the question that I now want to branch off of is, I've never heard of Mule Turga and L&L Curry. But I was also recently introduced to champagne and fried chicken, which is now one of my favorite pairings as well. What other... Must be nice. <laughs> <laughs> I have expensive taste. I, I grew up with a Iolani, very bro. expensive childhood, apparently. Um, but what are those wines that will help me get my friends into wine mm. with me without having to have that wine snobby food next to it? That or I the just, wine and food pairing specifically. Exactly, that are, yeah, Something fun to drink, but it doesn't have to be French cuisine mm. or French chef cooking the food. It's you. You're on. So you're asking, what kind of wines can you serve that they <clears throat> will do? Or well? he's asking like another example, a couple more examples of food and wine pairings that are comparable to your Mueller Turgal chicken katsu curry or really casual, yeah. oh, like sub oh. $15 plates that you would, here with another I would think wine. most of your contemporaries are eating pizza mm. and there's so many opportunities with pizza because you can do so many different things with pizza so I I, I have fun uh, with all kinds of red wines I'll, I'll grab wines from northern Italy Amarones and and varying types uh, I'll grab wines from uh, uh, Vakiras oh god um, southern uh, Rhone Valley of France yeah and uh, uh, there's a lot of, um, uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank, but um, heck, I think you guys talked about it on one of your shows too. Um, Schia, Schia Corello? Yeah, Chacarello. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Chacarello. From Corsica. Mm -hmm. and, Red wine grape from Corsica. Yeah, and then, you know, just depends on what you got going on in the pizza. There's all kinds, and those are all pretty affordable wines. Mm. So, so, so I have to tell you this funny story uh, that I've just remembered right now. He talked about Vakiras. That's a village like Chateau Neuf de Pop, like Chiron in, in the Southern Rhone Valley of France. There was a producer there that we wanted to see, but we were early. So we decided to stop in the town of Vakiras to have lunch. So it was this big room, big, and it was full of people, but they were workers. And it seemed like everybody came to eat lunch at the same time. So we had a party of one, two, three, four, and we were behind all the rest of the people. So of course, there's only one server, one waitress. And so it's gonna take her a while to come to us. Well, we only have 45 minutes to eat. So the guy who was spearheading this trip 
was kind of rude and pushy with her and kept flagging her down and saying he wanted this, 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 this. And it was kind of like offensive. You could tell she was pretty offended, you know, because he was downright, he was like, he was like a hockey player. You know, just, I mean, I remember that when we played basketball. Remember, he, he was like a hockey player, no finesse. So anyway, so we finally ate, and he was rude. He didn't leave any tip. It was just awkward. So when we drove to the next appointment, which, which was this winery that we wanted to see for the longest time, it was in uh, by the vineyard. She comes out of the front door, <laughs> and we're all sitting there in the in the van, going, "Oh my God, this visit!" <laughs> so that visit was very, very short. Let me just say that. Oof, <laughs> that was bad, man. So, <clears throat> um, how, where did you develop your taste for bringing in like things that weren't wine? Like he talks about your Scottish salmon back then. Mm -hmm. Um, your understanding of caviar back then, like where did all that stem from? That came from, uh, you know, reading and then traveling. I would go and say, okay, now I want to learn about these kinds of foods. Mm, and, like your Chianti uh, trip that you're explaining. Right. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> when, I, when I wanted to have uh, uh, dried meats, I wanted to find who's producing the, just like you would look for a wine producer, mm -hmm. I want to know who was producing the best prosciuttos and then Serrano hams and, you know, and things like that. And then, of course, I'd get um, uh, hit roadblocks because the FDA wouldn't allow us to bring it in. Or certain cheeses. Or certain cheeses. And then, uh, but always kept them on the radar until we finally got them approved or <coughs> we didn't necessarily get them approved, but they got approved. Mm -hmm. And then we, we were, you know, first to get them. So I think we were... I think we were the first uh, store in the in the country to get um, Serrano ham. Wow. We were also the only store in the state. Not that it was a big, uh, but it it, it was uh, it's a victory for me. The only store in the state that was not a franchise store that was allowed to scoop Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Wow! And I ate all the profits back at but what, <laughs> yeah. Wow! How did you? So we live in the age now of <laughs> the information age, right? Where we can just Google anything that we want to. Mm. How did you find or know who the producers are? How did you look this all up without Google? Google, yeah. <laughs> or <laughs> right, that, uh, yeah. That was the big challenge. Um, in many cases, I'd go visit uh, stores that I thought were, um, you know, uh, fantastic stores. So. One example for food was I flew I flew to Texas to see one of the original Whole Foods, and it was a really rustic store. But I wanted to know what was setting their food apart that was, um, you know, lighting a fire because they were starting to uh, become a chain store that was going to go outside of Texas and to California and others. And I would look for those kinds of retailers, and I would look at the kinds of uh, wines they would sell. And sometimes I'd find wines that I thought, okay, th this is cool. The other was mainly kind of like what Chuck does. You form relationships. Mm -hmm. If you find uh, someone who produces great wine, he usually or she usually is w more than wanting to share with you somebody that also produces great wine. And yeah, in the area or the grape variety or something like that. And you then they'll referrals. lead you to someone yeah. else. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Y your father, he just was... Are, are you from Hawaii originally, Uncle Richard? I came here when I was five years old. Wow. Oh. And what, Shit, what was what, that, 95 years ago? <laughs> what high school did you go to? Kaimuki. Oh. You know, he used to be a professional musician. All, all of their family, right? Yeah, I mean, he used to play with the Orient Express, Liz Damon. He, oh. was, very, he was very talented. So, Michael... You're getting coaching. Come on, step up to the plate, bro. <laughs> You're doing a great job, bro. Don't let these sharks of this pool eat you no, alive. Who, which shark is eating you alive? Both of you guys. Oh. Come on, Michael. Your moment. Take that. Chug that glass of wine, and then you're good to go. Speaking of chugging wine, what, what got you interested in, in wine in the first place? It's talking to you. Like, what, what? I think that's a question for both of you guys, yeah, really. Yeah, right, yeah, I would really love to know what got you into wine in the first place. Well, um, I worked as a waiter to put myself through college, uh, you know, to have money to spend. Um, you know, I didn't want my parents to pay for anything, so I just started working in restaurants. 
And I got promoted to managing restaurants. So I was manager of La Mer. I was manager of Bagwell's, you know, stuff like that. I was wine cellar master at the Cajal Hilton. And uh, whenever I do anything, I'm the type that needs to know everything there is to know about everything, except for the internet, by the way, and, and all this <clears throat> stuff. Michael knows how bad I am on all this stuff, but or golf for that matter. But normally or how I to used post to be. Instagram videos correctly. Yeah, <laughs> whatever. I used to be. Uh, you know, that kind of person. So when it came to wines, nobody could answer my question, so I just started studying. Your turn, Richard. You're not getting off the hook. I was going to college. I At and, UH as well? Uh, at, at UH, but I was also, uh, turns out there was this fantastic jazz band at Leeward Community College. So uh, uh, I was playing music in Waikiki. I was going to school in the daytime. In the afternoon, I'd drive to Leeward so I could play in that band. And then... Um, what was the name of that band, by the way? The Leeward Community College Band. Oh. I mean, they, some of those guys are still playing. They're awesome. Oh. Really? Um, and in fact, um, wow, well, that's a different story. But anyway, so, um, and then uh, one day uh, I, w I met a guy and he said, uh, you know, we got an opening for a part time job at this liquor store in Pearl Ridge. And I thought, okay, since I come out here all was the time. Was that a vintage wine cellar? No, I oh. wish. It was, uh, it was called a uh, the Pump Liquors. It yeah, was originally I that, Town yeah. Pump Liquors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I do. That was. Uh, it turned out to become life changing because um, there was a, a, a social science student that was working there, and his name was Albert Perez, and he lived. Oh, in, I remember Albert. Yeah. yeah. Why and I, he would be the last person in the world that you thought uh, enjoyed wines, and um, very quiet. Uh, Tough Hawaiian guy, and um, this this store that we worked at was a uh, high, high volume beer, <coughs> and so at the end of the night, we when we closed up, it would take us a couple hours to throw all those cases of beers and restack it, and you know put it in the in the reefer and all that, and then of course you're sweating and you want to get out of there and you're ready to leave, and one night, as I was trying to just pack up and leave and say goodbye, Albert, he was sitting there with a bottle of Parducci Chenin Blanc, open. And two glasses. And he said, try this. And I thought, okay. So he poured me the wine. And I didn't know what to say or what to do because I never tasted wine before other than T.J. Swan and Strawberry Hill and Spagnata. And uh, he started talking about the wine, which was completely foreign to me. I had never had an experience like that. So, okay, so I humored him, really. And... A few nights later, he did the same thing with another bottle and another bottle. And, you know, we weren't very rich. <laughs> oh, you're rich. We're, we're very poor. <laughs> anyway, oh, you're rich. he's spending money on wine <coughs> in a store that hardly sold any wine, although there was a wine selection. And uh, eventually, I started to understand what he was trying to do. Mm. And he was basically teaching me about wine. And that's how I started to learn about wine. And then from there, it was just a snowball effect kind of thing. Um, Kept going with it. Yeah, all kinds of different things happened, including losing a job. And so where did you study wine after that, up, up until opening up your own store? No, I, I uh, basically, you know, I didn't have the luxury of a mentor. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if I wrote a book about life, and not just about wine or learning about wine or learning about anything, it would be find a mentor because you would absolutely save, uh, you, you know half your life someone to point you in the right direction oh kind of yeah thing. Uh, yeah help you from making mistakes you made spending yeah. money on the things that you didn't need to spend it on and you know so on mm. and so forth well it's just like you know you're studying right now you know you're studying bordeaux and you're taking weeks i said that's too long man you, you know you're not going to get to the other regions mm -hmm. so that's the point you got to just uh make it practical on that note, though, I, I took a little Bordeaux test with our friend Rafa today, and I do have to admit that it did take me too long to study, and then I have to be more intentional when I do study. That's something that I learned. So Rafa is the uh, sommelier at the Aquarello Restaurant in San Francisco. <clears throat> like not just reading through it, expecting to retain the information, <laughs> have a game plan, you know? Hey, Af uh, hey Rafa, he's dropping your name, bro. <laughs> he's been helping me a ton, and Ariana as well, and Micah Sudeman. I'm just too. telling you, he's dropping your name, bro. <laughs> Michael. Turn the attention back to you. Come on, another question. This is your opportunity to ask your dad 
all those things. <clears throat> what you guys were talking about, with Ariana was sh- stunning him too. He, he didn't hear a lot of. I mean, neither have I. But about your stories about Bill Cosby and all these people doing events outside your store, he was he was super stoked. Did you hear about that? No, I didn't hear until I was watching. Can I set <coughs> you up first before you tell the full story? Oh, I don't need to tell the story. Yeah, go ahead. So he created an event. Uh, I was at the Hali Kalani, I believe then, or maybe I was Kahala. I think it was Hali Kalani. So that would have been the mid '80s. This was California was just now coming into Hawaii in a bigger way, and um, <clears throat> your your father created a, an event called Hawaii California Wine Festival. Yeah, Hawaii California Wine Festival, and he held it at the Shell, on the surrounding mm-hmm. grounds around the the, the actual uh, entertainment part. You know, just and he had all these wineries there pouring wines. What and it was shocking. Was we sold two thousand tickets? Yeah, it in was Hawaii, incredible. Nobody came to a wine event. <laughs> it was crazy. He had landmark back then. He had Chateau Montblanc. He had all the guns out of California, and it was shocking for me because these wines were not well known. But Richard, it was packed. Richard got all these people to come, and then the um, the centerpiece of uh, the event was Bill Cosby. Then went up on stage at the Shell and did a performance. Oh. Oh, you can fill out the details now, Richard, because he'd like to hear. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we did all kinds <clears throat> of crazy stunts when we we were looking for things that people would get excited about or hopefully would. Um, Beaujolais Nouveau all of a sudden became a thing, and there were events on the mainland, so I said, what can I do? So one year I hired a guy dressed up in a Santa Claus outfit in a uh, outrigger canoe we put two cases, we, we went to the airport, picked up the wine because it was flown in. We drove it to Waikiki. We put it in the panel. We sent it out. We called, uh, and we already uh, pre-set uh, the uh, TV station, so they had camera crews there. And then here comes Santa Claus bringing the first case of Beaujolais Nouveau to Hawaii. Uh, we had another one where we hired a helicopter to come bring that case from the airport to the Ilikai um, uh, helipad. I mean... You know anything and as everything a publicity we could think, stunt as kind publicity of publicity <laughs> stunt. We, and and you know after a while, Joe Moore, uh, we would give him a new nouveau tie, and every year he would wear the new nouveau wow. tie. And you know whatever it took to get people to think and talk about wine, no matter how silly, no matter what, make them think about us. Hopefully, but wine in general. Yeah. So a question that I have is um, kind of like you know up until this episode. You bring up Uncle Richard's name almost every podcast about how game changing it was. So for our viewers and for Michael and I, can you maybe list off a few things that he's helped you discover or discovered on his own? Like how you I, I forget who we we're talking to, whether it was Kevin Toyama or something like that, about how just how influential he's been to Hawaii's scene, if you can name a few Okay. So let me just say this instances. right up front, okay? Uh, I truly can say now, because Richard's going to say Chuck, 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 and I'm going to say Richard, 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 and then go back and forth ping pong. The truth of the matter is he and I had a sim- symbiotic relationship. I mean, we bounced off of each other. We nurtured, we, we, we inspired each other. I mean, that's, that's the true statement. We really, you know, he was retail, I was restaurants, hotels, et cetera, et cetera. And we always uh, wanted to be the best at what we carried, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's cognac or scotch or... What are the cases? I mean, the cheeses that I had at Halikulani and, and Kahala were amazing. You know, they're unpasteurized, all that, which was illegal at the time. But, you know, we were always, and even the cigars I carried, you know, he was the, the cigar guy here in Hawaii, you know, way before it was happening. And so <coughs> at, at La Mer, at, uh, at Halikulani and at Kahala, you could smoke cigars before. So I would be challenged to carry the best cigars. I was chasing him, actually. Oh. So we spurred each other on, et cetera, et cetera. So... You know, it was just that vision of looking for, not to be the next, the kind, the kind, the kind. It was about making sure that we always upped what we carried. Not expensive, not pricey, but that we had the best Calvado, or we had the best Scottish salmon, or we had the best cheese, or we had the best grappa, or whatever the case be. We just, cigars. I mean, it just, we, we, we inspired each other. We, you know, I always speak about Richard because, again, as I said on the earlier part, he championed <clears throat> products, mm. you know, and I think I did too. We both championed concepts of doing things better and better rather than just, and, and not to get wacky or not to get expensive, 
but ju- just what was the right call mm-hmm. on no matter what front we're talking about. So, you know, we went at it together just from two different angles, I think. Anyway, that's my story, your story now. Chuck, Chuck, Chuck. <laughs> See, I told you he would but say what, that. But what were some of the things that you guys went at it with each other and helped each other discover? Like cognac, like single barrel cognac or Krug Champagne or yeah. Santa Barbara. I mean, all these other people are looking at us like... Costa Yeah, Costa Rica. Shav. Yeah, I mean, you know, whoever heard of Coral Tea back <clears> then, you know? We were at Marius Gentas V and I. We were at Costa Rica, you know? Kermit Lynch had to floor stack those wines back then, you know, just to... Uh, because he couldn't sell it. Here's That's the Kermit guy. Lynch. That, yeah, here's yeah. a guy that, that that carried first carried Costa Rica in Hawaii. Today it's thirty five hundred dollars a bottle for the wow. Corton Charlemagne, and Richard had it at his store. You know, uh, for how much, the, Uncle Richard? Probably forty something. Dollars. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so understand, you know, I mean, you know, the examples. It can go into foods. I can go to cigars. I can go to everything. Anything you want to talk about, and that was Richard Field. Beers, you know, anything. We just. You know, I, I would walk into a store and I'd be inspired and he would come to our restaurants. I think he saw some things that, you know, would make him think, you know, it's just a symbiotic thing. I think we, we just ch- ch- together. Michael, your thoughts on that or questions, please. I wasn't born yet. <laughs> Uncle, do you have a question for Michael? Actually, I'm, uh, I was very impressed, especially lately, um, because when Michael was working at Alan Wong's, uh, I hadn't seen a lot of him but when we did get together and we had dinner he would break down wines and i would be in awe i would be wow wow okay let's see <laughs> what's going on here put a lot of and, alcohol and he didn't and, know <laughs> and and then you know we'd get together a few other times and we we do our own wines and it was very impressive um and then uh then i thought oh so maybe he is gonna start working in this direction mm. um, you had mentioned that at his wedding actually I did? Yeah, that you had thought that he might be in a trajectory to work in right. food and beverage mm-hmm. more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I'm also very proud of where he is now because his older brother, who is the, uh, I guess, a senior VP at one of the banks as a, a security specialist, uh, helped Michael become, uh, following his foot, uh, tracks, and now Michael's a big shot at uh, Bank of Hawaii, so I get all the money I want. <laughs> That, that's not the case, in case anyone from Bank Hawaii is watching. <laughs> Michael, do you have an aha moment of something from your childhood growing up um, through your upbringing and the experiences that you got to experience as far as wine and food? What are you looking at? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just kind of remember, like... When I was growing up, at least, it I, I just remember being exposed to all these foods that I'd go and ask friends at school and nobody had ever heard of them. Like, like I had foie gras, I had... The, um, the glass story from Uncle Kevin? I don't remember that story. I also have very you, bad you, memories. Do, do you want thing. me to interview your wife? <laughs> <and stuff? laughs> she, she knows me better than I know myself. So. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty handy. But I just remember having this zest for trying things because I got to try so many things as a kid that were all so <clears throat> delicious that I guess that's why I married a psalm. It's very convenient. It was his normal part of his life to have, yeah. the, you know, and not his brothers. Before exactly. <laughs> that's true. You're very different from <clears throat> your three uh, uh, brothers. You know, that's pretty different. You're, you're, yeah. And the other thing I want to say is, you know, you're grounded in food, too, even on the uh, Asian side, mm. because your grandparents, man, I mean, their food was s- some of the best, not only Chinese food, Hong Kong alley food, but some of the best food, period, in Hawaii, because he was like, did things the right way, you know, no skipping steps. I mean, he was like the Michelin three-star chef that just did things to the T, you know, so, you know, <coughs> your grandfather, your grandparents were also uh, very grounded or grouted in, in, in tradition too. I think that's also, mm. you know, great basic fundamentals and everything like that. So any other questions, gentlemen? Nope. Okay. Yep. So thank you to you too. Michael, <coughs> whoo, I had a whipping time with you today. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Wow. Richard, I appreciate it, bro. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Uncle.
to Kali and to all of you. Thank you for listening. Join us next week for the next episode. Until then, aloha, everybody. <laughs>